Welcome to Victoria Rumble Room, a little show on Vancouver Island that endeavors to bring you some of the big stories in Canada, the wide world, and of course, British Columbia and closer to home right here on Vancouver Island. I'm Robin Adair, and across town is the man that I depend on every week as my co-host with the most, the man of many shirts and many opinions, John Jurisic, the Croatian sensation. John, great to see you again. Oh, fantastic to be on the VRR. And there's so much going on, John. We have, we have uh, lots of views, for example, that we'd like to talk about today. We just were talking about the future of the NDP, and David Eby looks to be the heir apparent as the new leader of that party and British Columbia's next premier. We had Brad Zubik on the show to talk about what Mr. Eby is going to be facing when he becomes premier and uh, certainly have some feedback on that. Robin, the feedback component of the VRR has exploded. Uh, I don't know if it's one guy, 600 pounds sitting in his basement writing all these comments. <laughs> but nonetheless, our feedback has been enormous. And we had a lot of comments around our show with Brad Zubik talking about David Eby. I was surprised. There weren't many positive comments at this time. I, I don't know what that's a reflection of. We'll wait and see. Um, here's a message, for example, to illustrate my point, from Joanne, who writes, well, Canada's circling the drain, so why not BC too? I honestly feel we should be able to have a say in this. Horgan couldn't fulfill his commitment, so it should go back to the voters. Well, that's an interesting point of view, Joanne, and uh, we've had lots of them expressed about David Eby, which is very interesting. And I, I have a thought about David Eby and his right to govern. Uh, first of all, of course, we had an election, and the NDP overwhelmingly won that. John Horgan crushed the BC Liberals. He deserves the right to uh, hold the mandate and lead the government, and the NDP deserves that chance, even under a new leader. Now, David Eby may decide to go back to the uh, the electorate and say, I need a new mandate and call a snap election. I don't think that's likely going to happen. He needs more time. He needs a chance to clean up the doctor shortage, for one thing. There's the housing problems that we're facing. He needs to do some of these things now because he doesn't want to have to go hat in hand to the public without a solution to them. So I think what we're going to see is David Eby step into power and he's going to have an opportunity. It may not be a very wide window, but he's going to try to step through it and lead the province in a positive direction. And speaking of positive directions, City of Langford takes another positive step. John, your backyard uh, in, in so many ways because you've done so much work out in the Western communities and Langford is soon to have a new college slash university. We've been talking about it and you have a personal connection to it. Boy, do I ever. Uh, you know, this project, this uh, education development project has been talked about for, for quite some time. There's most definitely been a need to centralize some of the advanced education uh, services out on the West Shore. And congratulations to Langford and, and Langford Council. We first heard about this project from Mayor Stu Young about two months ago. Great to finally see it launched. Robin, Premier Horgan was on hand for the official unveiling of the $98 million building on Goldstream Avenue. Some folks have said about time. I mean, frankly, it is in his writing. Classes will be put on by University of Victoria, Camosun College, World Roads, and interestingly enough, the Justice Institute of BC. It's a great story. It's a great story for young people in the West Shore that they're able to take advantage of advanced education. I, however, have a small personal story, uh, likely small in the scheme of things, very important to me. This used to be a site of the Roman Catholic Church. The new building is going to be built on a site that housed um, a church building. and But not just any church, Robin. This is the place where my wife and I got married. Let's see, how many years ago? Many years ago. <laughs> At Our Lady of the Rosary. 
And so has special meaning to me. I am, you know, uh, I am uh, illuminating education vibes to the new building. <laughs> that is a good news story, John. And uh, I guess that's what happens when you marry a girl from Langford. You get to get married out there. And I, I guess this gives John Horgan a chance for some legacy. It's a legacy piece. He was looking for something, I think, at the BC Museum. He is going to get it with this new announcement about the new college. So uh, that's good on him. Anyway, let's uh, let's shift topics again, uh, John. There's so much more to talk about on this show. I want to talk a little bit about jargon. We've been into this before. Some of the jargon you're hearing from various political voices and both in Canada, the United States, and around the world. Like, for example, we have Pierre Polyev doing just this. He is uh, throwing out all kinds of phrases like, uh, let's uh, make Canada the freest country in the world, You know, indicating that somehow we're not a free country. And uh, he loves to brand Justin Trudeau as, uh, you know, just basically an empty vessel who is something of a, uh, a prima donna and comes from an elite that gives little regard to regular people. But people like Justin Trudeau should continue to jet around the world to wonderful places like Davos uh, and to co high price conferences where he and his fellow uh, travelers uh, make plans for everyone else's lives. It's two classes of people. The rules for me are different than the rules for thee uh, under this prime minister. And see here we see the consequences. Nothing is getting done in this country. You know, Robin, as two folks, you and I, uh, ostensibly deeply involved with communication, th this is fascinating. These little clips, these little things, the branding that comes up. Recently, I noted Hillary Clinton has now been selling hats that say it's just the emails <laughs> like and all the money going towards obviously uh democratic uh, electoral prospects fascinating in canada the the conservatives are trying hard to brand the liberals with these little quips i'm sure the liberals are working hard to come up with new quips for the conservatives meanwhile across the water the forces that wanted to take the uk out of the european union used take our country back as the British as their successful Brexit brand. And of course, the master of branding, I hate to compliment this man whatsoever, but he's really good at this. Donald Trump loves talking about making America great again. This mega movement has become a revolution down south, th the likes of which we don't know where that will end. So why not ask an expert, you and I, Chatted with UVix Dr. Michael Prince. Why is so? Why is branding so important in politics today? I'd like to just go into some of the the tactics, the strategies, the branding of, yeah. of these populist leaders and 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 parties, and right. and what are they appealing to with some of these slogans in 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 uh, the UK during Brexit? The the motto was "Take back control." Yeah. In states, we obviously know Trump was promising to make America great again. We now hear uh, uh, conservative leadership candidates talking about taking back control of your life. Oh, I, I mean, I don't connect to any of this. Yeah. Who do these slogans appeal to? Why have they been so effective? What's going on with this stuff? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it shows that there's. you can never underestimate the power of a good, simple slogan. <laughs> You know, uh, you know, I think back, I mean, there was good slogans in the old days, there are now. So some of this may be accentuated by social media, of course, but the underlying phenomena that, you know, uh, a, a, an effect, I won't say a good politician, but an effective politician is one who can kind of connect to some people, right, with a message. And for good or real, John, these mottos that you just cited or these slogans, um, they are having an effect. I mean, uh, the, the Trump make America great again, um, uh, what a powerful marketing tool. Then the, with the MAGA and the, the red ball caps, it became a whole uh, brand, truly a brand. You're right. Um, and, uh, and you know, that's, that's been part of politics for at least a generation, right? Social marketing and messaging and spin. But these, the sloganeering that's going on right now is, is uh, nothing subtle. There's not much nuance of anything. They're, they're, they're both black and white. And they're clearly connecting to people who... Uh, <clears throat> feel disaffected um i mean there's always been, there's always a critique about <clears throat> about the elite right well there's a political elite 
and I'm not part of it. And I don't like that elite. And they're, they don't represent me. And they're making decisions <clears throat> that, uh, that rub me the wrong way. And, you know, and Trudeau is, a, is an easy example of that. And, um, and, and so, uh, you know, and he's, he's been a, a criticized by that. But this, this taking the notion of liberty or freedom that certain conservative politicians in Canada are now using, they're using it in almost a libertarian way, which is, you know, it's anti-authority. And that's what I think really troubles uh, traditional conservatives is that conservatives, if nothing else, have always believed in order <laughs> and stability. Yeah. There's a lot of resentment out there that yeah. I think is not just political jargon that's also real. And they're oh, yeah. turning to people that are trying to offer answers. And it's almost like fundamentalism. If they yep. make the answers simple and say, if you do this, everything will be better, people really grasp onto it. And I wonder if that isn't what we're seeing right across the globe as we, we see these trends which aren't that dissimilar in other parts of the world, in Europe and other yep. parts of the world, what we're dealing with here. Yep, yep. And, and yeah, and what, what's interesting is, is how COVID has played out on that. And, you know, and certainly for the short term in Canada, it seemed to be by and large, not totally, but by and large, a unifying experience. You know, uh, but people then ran, got tired, fatigued, and uh, it's no longer the positive uh, message of how government stepped up, science stepped up, public health stepped up, and people, so people want, part of this freedom and end the mandates, right, this freedom convoy slogan, end the mandates, well, mandates can be read as a government's mandate, uh, I mean, sort of, sort of some, some of the really wild, crazy stuff in Ottawa was around, oh, we want, we want the Trudeau government to resign, and we want the governor general to, you know, and we just, wacky wacky stuff so this end the mandate stuff is still about that but there's uh, in the vaccine mandates well they're pretty well all ended uh but uh i still believe that you know majority of canadians support and supported what we just went through in the last two and a half years on on the pandemic um you know the freedom was the freedom was through security of our government stepping up in a major way uh but you're right Trudeau's now been in power for seven years. He's had three elections. Uh, this is this is the time where people, you know, uh, and he's won two elections with 31% of the popular vote, which is unheard of. He's just set two records of, you know, he's now answered the question, how low can you get a popular vote and still form a government? Well, the answer is 31%, and the winner is Justin Trudeau. So great to hear from Michael Prince. You know, John, I, I'd like to get some hats that say rumble on. That's our brand. We can have rumble on hats. I love those. <laughs> let's, let's rumble in Canada. Uh, great to hear from him. Um, you know, and uh, speaking of rumbling, hats off, of course, to people from uh, BC Healthcare Matters. They were down marching on the pavement in front of the health building, the BC Health Building, and uh, again, trying to raise awareness of the fact that we have this massive doctor shortage. A million people in British Columbia do not have a family doctor. One in four in southern Vancouver Island do not have a family GP. This has to change. It is a major, major election issue, and we'll have more to say about that. But let's shift again now to transportation. And, uh, you know, the CEO and president of the uh, Greater or the Victoria Airport Authority is Jeff Dixon, and uh, he feels that transport needs to be improved to and from the airport. And uh, we ran a short clip of this, and you know we already have had lots of response. For example, David writes us, absolutely right about Uber. How many tourists get off a plane or a ferry uh, with the lucky to go application fully installed? This is a huge topic in the on the peninsula, this notion of, of how people move around and specifically how people move around from the airport uh, to other parts of, of the lower Vancouver Island. And of course, Lucky to Go is another ride service to the airport, which is now partnered with Wilson Transportation, I think that's fantastic, with a shuttle bus. As far as a service to the airport goes, I say the more the merrier. Let's help people move around. It's good for business. So here's another note from a former cab driver, BJ, who writes, it's amazing to me that Jeff Dixon is calling for Uber to operate in Victoria. 
when he knows full well it would devastate the, the taxi industry. Yet the airport is still being serviced by Yellow Cap, who now refused to pay the airport for the stand, as they did prior to COVID-19. Our viewer suggests letting all the cab companies share the airport, but it looks to me, looks to me, like the airport authority is ready for more competition. So we'll see what happens. Anyway, let's now learn more about what's happening in our local friendly skies and zoom in CEO Jeff Dixon. Oh gosh, and now back with us again in the Victoria Rumble Room is Jeff Dixon, who's been president and CEO of the Victoria Airport Authority now for over a decade. Jeff, I can't believe it. <laughs> it feels like I've just met you yesterday. <laughs> yeah, time uh, goes up. Hey, right. Uh, so, okay, look, just give us a sense of what's happening at the airport, because really last time we chatted with you, things were not looking that good because of this, you know, this uh, disease. Yeah, so a lot better since we've last spoken. I, I think, um, you know, to contrast it, I think in March of March, April 2020, business dropped 98%, which is pretty uh, stunning. We are now, we always relate to 2019 and the traffic volumes in June and July are, June was 88% and June, July is going to be, I think, pretty close to 90%. So, you know, touch wood, we're pretty close to where we were in 2019, which is a far cry from 2% at the start of the pandemic. That is fantastic. Well done, well done. Wow, yeah. great news. And likely leading to a recent announcement about a new airport hotel on the way. Tell us a little bit about that as well. Yeah, so it's uh, uh, Marriott Town Suites. The, uh, the property uh, in question is on airport lands. It's uh, at the southwest corner of Beacon Avenue and the highway. And we have just, you know, one of the things that we recognize during the pandemic is how much of our revenue is tied to passenger activity and, uh, you know, planes coming and going, and, and we really need to diversify. Now, this isn't going to solve that necessarily, but it's all part of the strategy to just build other uh, revenue streams that are not necessarily you know, oh, they're pandemic agnostic, I'll say, is the rent is rent. So um, we've negotiated with the Qatari group that uh, they're, we're gonna be submitting to Sydney Council for their review. We, they don't ultimately have final approval because it's zones, but we do wanna understand the feedback and design issues and things, but it's 129 uh, room uh, hotel. Um, more more suites for extended stays as well, kitchenettes and, and the like, uh, conference center, and uh, a to be named uh, national brand uh, restaurant that will be sort of attached or on the site, uh, but separate from the hotel. You're bringing a lot of business in, I guess, and uh, the yeah. idea is to have business people who can use that as the base, no matter where they're operating in Greater Victoria. And I would yeah. think this also has to be related in some ways to this other big project, which is nearing completion, which is going to be this new industrial center for Amazon, which is on the other side of the property. And uh, we've talked about this before with you, but we've yeah. uh, never been able to talk about it where it's getting this close to fruition. So how close and what difference is it going to make to the airport operation? Yeah, so the Amazon group, uh, they took eight acres of... Uh, uh, of real estate from us. Uh, they, they've been under construction for uh, the better part of 12 months. Um, the project's gonna be actually complete this October. And uh, so that, and then they will stage into that. It's a last mile distribution center. Um, sort of initially the change to the airport won't be that dramatic, but our, our feeling is over time, it's gonna grow. You'll see more air cargo coming in this way. You know, a lot of those products right now are coming by, uh, uh, ocean uh, and in, and then out uh, from the warehouse itself, but there'll be natural synergies um, as we grow and see. Uh, it's so good to have Amazon's presence on the peninsula. I mean, they're just committing to the Victoria marketplace, and it's a pretty big deal. Uh, you know, so many business lines operating within the airport. Folks don't 
folks don't get that. It's not just planes coming in and out. It's it's maintenance of all the lands. It's yeah. it's quite a bit of restaurant activity and and uh, and stuff going on within the airport. How have how has that rebounded? How is that doing? All of the internal stuff. And then the stuff on the other side of the security line, there's an entire world that now goes on in there. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, it's interesting. We, uh, I, I sat down with the marker group or Grant Rogers probably three years ago and said, hey, how, you know, I really like that Victoria Gin product, for example. Why don't we create a distillery in the airport? And so we did a deal literally in about half an hour, a piece of paper back and forth. Obviously, you got to figure out. Okay, well, great. That's the structure of the deal. The implementation is a little more complicated, but we were uh, so it's been up and running. Again, staffing challenges, but we were just named uh, best new concession in North America by Airport Council International, which is pretty cool when you think about you know Victoria up against Atlanta Airport or Salt Lake City or Seattle. Those are some of the other winners. So. You know, I, I think it's kind of an interesting concept, and we're always trying to evolve the local flavor if we can. The rest of the restaurants, though, I mean, I, I, it's being brutal, and I, I wish we could all figure out where the workers have gone. So I guess a, a part of that, what I, I assume, has to do also with people simply working at the airport in terms of security people and yeah. people at customs and people that are uh, doing your, your, your baggage and all the different functions that go into running an airport. Uh, yeah. how, how bad did it get when you tried to jam up operations again? And, and where would you typify it now? I mean, how, how critical a situation is the worker shortage to the airport at this moment? Yeah, well, it's interesting. When we went through the pandemic, most of the airports were laying off staff. I went to our board right away and said, that would be the last thing I'll do. I mean, we've got to cut costs, but I, the last thing I'm going to do is lay off staff. So we actually got through it uh, without laying anybody off. So it helped us ramp back up fairly quickly. Uh, but what a lot of people don't understand is sort of in the airport, there's a number of different businesses, right, that aren't airport employees. So you've got the airlines, of course, I think people understand that that's different, but the security screeners, typically there's 120. Uh, when they have a full complement, they're operating with about 90 right now. So there's shortages. So if you don't have enough uh, on staff at any particular time to meet peak demand, those lineups get kind of explosive in, in terms of, you know, their ability to process. And so that's where we've seen some congestion and it's frustrating for us. We're working very closely with them, sharing advanced demand numbers from the carriers of what they can expect. But if they don't have the staffing at certain times a day, that's when you get those 20, 30, 40 minute times in a lineup, which isn't good because the standard is 85% of people under 15 minutes is where they should be. And then we find the same at the bigger airports where international arrivals Yes. You know, there aren't enough staff for, again, another government agency, which is CBSA, to process all the all the individuals coming in from foreign flights. So, you know, I mean, it is uh, it's frustrating in a sense that we've known for a long time that uh, the traffic's going to pick up again this summer. And sure enough, it's ahead of projections, but not that far ahead. And uh, many elements of the industry are struggling and they shouldn't be. You know, even the airlines themselves are kind of going, well, we thought we could do it. And they're realizing they can't deliver the schedules that they, you know, that they hoped. They saw the demand come up and it's all well and fine to try and make best efforts to accommodate it. But if you are short pilots or flight attendants or ground handlers, you better not try and squeeze in a schedule that you can't deliver because it makes for a really bad customer experience. It's so great to hear that the things are going better despite yeah. these uh, employment uh, challenges. And of course, COVID is still here, you know, and yeah. I'll, I'll give you a, just a little story that then leads into how the airport is handling handling a COVID protocols. My mom, 86, 87 years old, just came back from Europe and interesting enough was chosen randomly yeah. through the Arrive Can app to be, uh, to be COVID tested. Of course, that caused quite a bit of turmoil on this side of the Atlanta, <laughs> this side of the ocean for us. So tell us, like, how have, how are are these protocols still very much in play? Uh, how how are people expected to react to them? So, you know, it's, it's there's some people think this 
this pandemic's gone away. That that is not the case. Yeah. No, there is. So all international flights into the four major airports, uh, Montreal, Toronto, uh, Vancouver, and Calgary. There is random testing, uh, which is exactly the case of your, is it your mother? Is that what My you mother, said? yes. Yeah. yeah. And, but it's not, you're not tested in airport. You go away and then you'll do your testing. And if you test positive, you'll have to um, sort of isolate for uh, 10 to 14, I think it's 10 days, you'll have to isolate. But those protocols are still in place. Um, you know, it's a step forward. We'd like to see them gone completely, but it's certainly better than doing the testing in the airports because the airports aren't built to do that. We're not hospitals. Mm -hmm. And so you build a certain footprint of an arrivals hall that can process X hundred people per hour. But when you're adding process under normal conditions, but when you're adding sort of all the testing and all that, you can imagine it adds so much time per passenger to process that you just can't physically do it. Great information from Jeff Dixon and lots of important things taking place at the airport. We'll be keeping you fully apprised as they develop. And, you know, pandemic or no pandemic, people certainly are starting to fly. People want to travel. People want to get out of town. Uh, I know the COVID pandemic is not over, but people say, well, I've got my vaccinations. I'm willing to take the chance. It's time for people to travel. And I think we could use a reduction in the mandates, frankly. I think that people now accept, I could get sick. I still want to go. And I think all the mandates need to be put to the side, as they have been in many Western countries like the UK and the United States. And I don't mean that we move on from getting vaccinated. I think that's going to be with us now for the foreseeable future. People will be getting their shots every year and getting booster shots. And that's just the way it is. But uh, people would like to have a little bit more freedom around that. However, I fully expressed this earlier in an editorial and uh, some people took exception to it. They didn't like me saying those things. Jody wrote, I hope people remember you when the people are gathered up and facing charges for crimes against humanity. Disgusting. <laughs> and, you know, I was just trying to show some understanding, really, for people on both sides of the fence. But, uh, you know, it's still appreciated that people feel they can write the Rumble Room and tell us what they think. And, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll continue to bring these notes on. And uh, as for criminal charges, I'll be ready. I'll be ready for <laughs> it. I'm not entirely sure what I would do. I suppose we would rumble from from a cell, um, <laughs> a fake one, as they did at the recent CPAC conference down in the states. Nonetheless, I'm uh, so glad to to uh, to finally uh, take all of the con the great content we had today, and uh, and and talk about how all of you folks can join in the fun. And that's particularly through our Facebook page, our Twitter page, our YouTube page. That's the bulk of the Rumble Room content. And then we also have three, I call them outliers, that being our uh, Facebook news and views group, where you can all participate with your sharing your viewpoints. Absolutely Instagram and absolutely TikTok. And I remain, as always, the mayor of North Saanich, the Croatian sensation, and the unofficial town crier of Saanich, John Juris. And while I never like to see you cry, Johnny, I still applaud the fact that you have the, uh, you have the ability to come out and admit it like a man. So, rumble on. <laughs>